Hi, everybody. It's May 20th. Yes, it's May 20th, 2022. And this is Drawing Lessons with Marshall Vandruff from Heinrich Klei. You might wonder if the teacher only gives you a single slide of different kinds of studies, what kind of a response students would give. And I looked at your work yesterday and last night till about one in the morning, and I was really pleased. We will see about 16 of them, four at a time. Uh, just starting here with Julie's story variations up there. You dared to say, I'm going to try some of these scenes and do some differentnesses with them. Art doing a wide angle thing up here, which if you haven't tried that, that's a form issue. That's a camera lens issue. That is a proximity of the camera to the action issue. The closer you get, the more exaggerated depth looks. It's also really hard, but art was not afraid. Vivian giving us what looked like, like copies of his work, including imitating some of his lines nicely, technique, and cord. Cord, you may want to process these to make them easier to see. I know it's work in Photoshop, but thank you, those of you who spent time compositing slides and doing self-designed projects in response. Some of these I will return to, just establishing them here. Bernard, we'll get to you later. You did what I hoped someone would do, the story stuff. So I think we'll end the class on yours. Even if your work is not in here, look up here. Look at how Sammy makes up an exercise, not as a light and dark analysis. This is very different but as seeking shapes to see how they register as light and dark. You didn't get that from me. But as I look through these and see that you're trying things with different camera angles and some anatomy studies and variations, I see you applying Creativity 101 to the exercises. Preston, your question about underdrawing will be answered with a slide. Kia offering us analysis with exaggerated ellipses and flat designs. Konstantinos, you're asking, should I use reference? Is it against the spirit of Cly, Constantinos, reference is good. Copying reference is not good. Reference means refer to. Great artists use reference. Damien, if all that happened in the first two weeks is that drawing has made you feel a change in how you start a drawing, that is, that is the ignition. May there be more. Sarah, good observation up here about Bridgman, Nicolaides, and Cly. Bridgman and Nicolaides being on opposite sides and Cly somehow bridging them together. I never put the three together in a thought, a holy trinity of 100-year-old influences. Matt, you are 
you are growing in awareness and sensitivity, as you mention in your note. Good. Because you can see the mountains doesn't mean that you can get there easily. But you're not likely to get there unless you can see them and deliberately travel in that direction. Carlos, if you enjoyed the transformation of 2D shapes into 3D forms and felt like it was a breakthrough, if you enjoyed it, we're going to take that up. And yes, the, the shapes, the negative shapes as scissors. L look at this. Look at his, his awareness of and concern for negative shapes as interesting shapes. You say, what makes an interesting shape? Well, that's, that's your decision. But look, look how even this, this shape looks like a Cly figure. Uh, in his, his, his negative shapes are interesting. And that is worth turning into an exercise for design skills. I have a friend who, when he was a student, loved Neil Adams and was a, setting out to be a comic book artist and became a comic book artist. But what bugged him was that his, his attempts at comic book pages never looked as good as Neil Adams. And uh, our teacher, Bob Miller, had him put tracing paper overlay over Neil Adams' pages and over his own pages, and then do his best to copy or to fill in the negative shapes. And then pull the tracing paper away so you didn't see the imagery anymore, put it up on the wall. And my friend looked at it and saw, ah, the abstract design. The abstract design is something that an artist who composes is aware of, and that includes what would happen if you put tracing paper over this and just filled in the negative shapes and you looked and you said, wow, those are, those are really interesting shapes. Good. Ashwini, I hope to see any attempts at your expressive ink wash style somehow related to Cly. You have a style. I know. I've seen it. You have one week. You want to try something where you do homages to his images, but with your technique? The thing for our final session is influenced in any way by Cly. It's all up to you. Not to put pressure on you, but if you play with the instrument or the instruments you know so well, and do some, some cover songs. It may yield. Thank you all. Now we're going to do something I haven't done before. I'm going to give this a try. We're going to go through about 15 or 20 of your slides at full size and see if I can stay on time. But some of them had things in them that I wanted you to see up closer. We'll start with Rose. Hi, Marshall. I bought the animal drawing book you recommended at the last Cly session and practiced as much as I could using it. I can only copy from references, Cly's drawings, and I also did some studies of some Disney horses. Can you please give me your feedback on how to improve my horse drawings? How can I draw better and from imagination? I know this is a big question, so please forgive me. Rose. Feedback on how to improve? Big question. But since you're asking for forgiveness, melded right in with the question, if you hadn't acknowledged that that's a big question, I would have ignored you because I answer it all the time. But you, you are on your way. Look at those horses. Uh, one suggestion, maybe less shading for these kinds of studies. I know shading makes it look nice. But shading is not study. Shading is decorating. And you're trying to, to get good form. Better, instead of shading, to seek cross contours, which are harder than arbitrary shading. But Rose, I wanted people to see. 
Just keep doing this kind of thing with those lessons from the Bridgman course and the Proko course and this book that you've bought and Cly or any cartoonist you want to draw like. You are on your way. I see you in the forest. You are not lost. You are headed north to the land of sunshine and strong rain, strong horses, maybe some funny ones. We'll know that later. Good job, Rose. Gabrielle, is there a point where there is too much unnecessary cross contour? Is there such a thing as too much cross contour? The answer is yes. You can overdo cross contours. You have overdone cross contours. Unless there really are stripes or accordion divisions like here, I mean, there really are cross contours all over this. Otherwise, use them only when an area gets If that's shaped like that, and that's shaped like that, we might forget what it's shaped like in here. Or we might forget that it's starting to change direction a little bit. But there is another reason to, to do this, and that is that it might be one shape here. And it might be another shape here. And it might be yet a third shape there. So when something changes form, or if an area gets so empty you forget what it is, that's when to use them. And it would be better to do fewer and be more sure of them. I'm not sure we're looking up at that back. I think we're probably looking down at that back. I don't know that but I'm questioning it so that you might question it. And to, to make the distinctions of, let's see, I think one right in the middle, maybe two between. Make the distinctions according to those two criteria. Did it change form or would I forget? But you moved in the direction of doing cross contours and this could be built. So congratulations. Look at how that one's starting to go up away from us. And down here, it's starting to go down away from us. It's not changing the, the form so much as it is the direction. Good, Gabrielle. Jody, you're using a fountain pen and a Canson pen and ink sketchbook. Some sketch from real things. Not totally sure what the content of the homework assignment should be, whatever you want it to be. But since you're looking at Cly, makes sense to go to him for your inspirations. But I want to make a suggestion. And this is about pen and ink technique. Because that's what you have presented mainly up here is pen and ink technique. Uh, next week. And I won't be able to give you feedback the following week. So here's a quick observation for now. With pen and ink, it is usually wise to simplify lights and darks into pleasing patterns. This may involve making the black parts into just spot black shapes, like Mike Mignola and Frank Miller do, or making the lights into just light shapes, where you don't put detail in the light areas. You find all these areas where light would be falling and you wash them out. You are doing something here that I spent most of my adult life habitually digging in, and it led to dirty half tones because I was never aware of them. I put detail in the shadows and put detail in the lights, and I can hardly keep from it. If you want more on this, the Bridgman course will take you through some of it. Dorian Eaton will take you through more of it. In fact, in my middle age, he was the one who uh, explained this to me. 
showed it. Here we have, I tried rotating the characters, but I have trouble placing the landmarks in space. Is it just perspective plus anatomy issue or is it something more? So if so, is there any efficient way I can work on that? Again, in the Bridgman course, we have one of these sessions that has to do with right angle studies. So these questions have been addressed elsewhere, but, but Noe, trying as you have is good for your brain. And if you can bring this kind of freedom to your drawings someday, as you struggle with getting things right, right now, you'll draw very well. These are nice. Andres, it's an odd style of study, an amalgam of form and technique and straight choppy lines and fluid ones. But if you're feeling good about it, a natural way to play, keep at it. Sometimes the juggler who starts right in with six balls proves it possible. My suggestion is usually to separate out different approaches. But if a student says, I jump in and doesn't panic and keeps at it, you will swim in your own holistically developed way. And Andres, these are good. I mean, that's a thick, strong looking leg. There's some good things going on in here. Thanks for doing these. Diane, I'm gonna take a few minutes with you. Be careful of forcing roundish things into pure circles. Uh, the left snail is in the lead by a head. You found that by making lines that go down and then uh, uh, figuring the, uh, <laughs> figuring where the perspective would reveal it. Let's take a look at the, uh, let's take a look at that original up there. This, this could very well be an ellipse, a circle right there in that position. But you can see over here, it's got a little lip that goes up there may be variations. And certainly the way to solve that is to say the axle on that circle, if the edge of that ellipse was there, and then if we were to make it land on the ground, it would lie down like, like that and have the top of it there. So the angle is important. And if something is roundish, why not? Why not start with a circle? Now let's zoom in here. You're in the right direction. You could, you could loosen up a bit, maybe, maybe. But if you keep working and seeing that form, let's zoom in even more on the one on the right. Be sure of the side plane there that's a side plane. I'll put an X on it. I assume that you're aware of a side plane over there and that there will be a point where that, this and this and this and this and this would all be one plane. And then when you get more advanced, you may be able to pull things out forward and make, make things go back and turn this from a blocky section. That would be uh, this part right here to a part that could go into a more triangular section, where if you cut away from it like that, you'd see it a little different. But you did a good job. And I want to show uh, one issue about these. Give me a moment here. I want to get a black marker. 
That is very precise, but it is not accurate. This line is correct because the depth line would go like that, and you've got them at right angles. Good. That's correct. But you've got the peak of this angled in, in some other way, and the peak would actually be the peak, the longest point that you've got in this position. You'd need to take that and swivel it over to there to land like that, and it's going to be a little it's significantly more, more vertical uh, there. So you may have misunderstood something, but I want to show you an example. Instead of taking all of that time, to be sure of the cleanliness of the lines. A looser approach might be better. Nino Lobo is giving us an example of a very loose approach, but... Okay, Carla, uh, what, what I see here is that you, you did each one of these separately, and here you composited them to overlap, and you know that, that it's not important. Uh, last week, everybody, when I was pointing out that to have a ground plane and to say that things are going to fit more or less in something that you can see on the ground, how important that is to establishing that this peck perspective looks real, there's two things. One is it does not have to be that precise unless it needs to be that precise. Most of the time, I think Clyde just put a few loose lines in there. But there's another thing. They don't all have to land where their feet would make sense. Drew Struzan did a poster for a movie called Return to Oz, which I've never seen the movie, but I have a limited edition print of it. And uh, he told us, a group of students back in the 80s, that there was no way they could get all those characters on that couch. He said nobody ever questioned it. He changed the scale. He fitted in there. His concern was to make compositional decisions that felt good for what he needed for that poster. And so that's where going in and caring about the values and the shapes and the negative shapes, all that works. But here's why I wanted to spend some time on this, is that look how these are quite loose, freehand ellipses, and yet they may be doing their job just right. Carla, one thing to do as you're doing analysis to make things clear, is that the side that is closest to you, if you make the side that's closest to you a little darker, I think this one over here, that, the, that this side is closer, and this one over here, that the other curve direction is closer. And one way to make sure that that cannot be misread is to use a little atmospheric perspective that the other side of the ellipse is a little lighter or darker. Here's the way we do it in class, in classes where we're actually studying this. We just do two ellipses. And if they were the same ellipses, we're going to say this one we're looking up at. And so the center would be there and the axle would come out that way. This one is the same ellipse, but we're going to look down at that and give it the corner there, and then we've got our peg there. And, and same ellipse, but two opposite positions, and the one that's closest is the one that if you really got to be a master, I'm sure Cly could do it. He can fling it at an ellipse and dig into the one closer to make it darker. Good work. Look at this over here, even doing a bit of a uh, lofting. <laughs> Julia, you've got a statement here, addictively fun, playing, minimalist sensibilities. It's not all fun, and it's okay to share struggles. Here is a struggle. Impatience and fear. You're not enjoying this. How can one develop the patience for this kind of thing? Is it necessary? Is it necessary to develop patience for form analysis? No. You could get good at it impatiently, but it's not likely. And if you don't like doing it, 
Christian. It's unlikely you'll ever compete with people who like it or even kind of like it. You can like it too much and create well-drawn dead figures. You decide what you need it for or at all. And you have many other options for form, including photography, theater, dance, building 3D models. This analysis is one of the best skills you can have if you want to draw freely with spatial credibility. Without it, you find other ways to solve the problems, but you decide that. Now, if it's of any help, I want you to show, I want you to see a secret that is well known. Hi, Marshall. I very much enjoy doing these structure analysis. The more I study Cly, the more I love his art. Oh, Julian, yeah, I know. Let's zoom in. That's not likely to happen from someone who doesn't enjoy giving it a shot. I have forced students to learn this out of fear of their grade. They paid $3,000 to submit to the work and discover unhappiness. But a few who have done well have thanked me at conventions. Oh, I can't believe how much I learned doing that. And I say, I love you. Look, look at this. Let's zoom in tighter. That is well analyzed. And whatever problems it introduces, like comparing hawks, are now clear. This one needs to get thickened on X, deepened on Z, and tapered on Y. And the tools to do that are already on the page. Good work, Julian. Kraken, if I am pronouncing your name incorrectly, let me know. Some analyses on top and a little bit of the bonus stuff. Form seems to be where I struggle the most. And anatomy. Any suggestions? Yes. Study form and anatomy. Sorry to sound like a smart ass, but what else could I answer? Roast old bones and sacrifice your best vegetables? I don't know any other way. Study form and anatomy. You have plenty of resources. Come on, you can do better questions than that. Carlin, worthy work studying form and anatomy. I have seen students get great with little from me and much from each other. And that's what I see happening here. Look at these. Kraken, look at these. See if that inspires you. This is analyzed in more than one way, analyzed as flat shapes and as forms. Is there a difference between anatomy and construction? Yes. You can construct out of Legos and make it pretty non-anatomical. You can know ana anatomy. You can know anatomy really well and make it look all mushy. Constructing with blocks first and then making it anatomical is fine. And the other way around. Charting anatomy and then chunking it up is fine. You decide that by trying it both ways. Good work here of both kinds. And more over here. I've got some good slides to show. This is going to be worth it. I hope I'm teaching you in response to this. If you feel like he's going over time on the student work, I am going over time on the student work. I hope I'm not wasting time by going over time. I'm hoping this is useful. Rebecca, such good observations, and you did the work of getting up and holding the pose 
Few students do that, and we didn't mention it in here, but for those of you to whom that is news, it's an assignment in the Bridgman course. And these notes, too small to see, for how often he has his characters with their arms away from their bodies for silhouette read. When I saw that, I thought, yeah. And I looked at several pictures and I thought, one arm away from the body, one arm blended in. Both arms away from the body for silhouette read. One arm away from the body, one arm away from the body, one arm away from the body, one arm away one arm away, one arm hidden in. You know, where limbs are melded into the body in the shapes or projected out from the body, just going through Cly's collection for that alone could help you in your designs. Thanks for that and your learning experience by striking the pose. Phoenix... You are committed to analyzing compositions, light and dark patterns, technique, and you have, you have expressed a desire because Cly knows his subjects so well that you, you hope to know some animals that well also, including deer. And you have now been introduced to Rico Lebrun's other people might know about this, might not know about this. Rico Lebrun taught the Disney artists uh, about deer when they were working on Bambi. Look it up. There's even photographs of him with the Disney. He did a, a number of pages. I don't know. It's more than 20, maybe 30 or more of all of these simplified skeletal deer. Really nice for movement. Sisyphus. Sisyphus, you don't need a teacher. I'm glad I get to teach you. But you are one who can uh, work out studies on your own. Matt, is he mostly concerned with graphic design and story, but knows anatomy and perspective so well that they just leak into his drawings? Never heard that one before. Yeah, Matt, anatomy and perspective leak into his drawings. Leaking is one way to look at it. It's like saying math just leaks into everything this guy does. He wants to be emotional, but when he laughs or cries, he estimates how many, calorie, how many calories he's burning up, and he can't turn it off. This is, uh, this is one analogy, leaking. Uh, Looking at his work from a global perspective, everything seems so correct and real. But once I zoom in on his drawings, parts of them look like he's making attractive shapes and all perspective and verisimilitude were just luck. This is a profound observation. I never really saw it until I was in my 40s at a show in LA of John Singer Sargent's original works that put me in danger of publicly hyperventilating. It was that big view looks real, close in, looks so abstract and accidental that it looks like it just happened. Sargent's work is extremely abstract when you get close to them. They are hyper-realistic when you step back from them, and then that tension is a quality common to great artists. It is both the lyrics and the music the story and the dynamics of the camera movement and the actor's pacing and the cuts. It's the musical quality of poetry. Well, in drawing, it's the abstract design and the illusionary form. Look, look, that is jazz. Look at the little bit of pencil there. I think that little bit, bit of pencil, I think that little bit of pencil is him looking at the horse's rear end the way I often do, that you've got a sense of going up there to the center line and down there like that, and then going in a little concave because that happens. 
And it's even more complex than that. That line has got a, a quality that gives it a bit of that butterfly shape. It has lyrics. It's a horse. But it also has music. It's a bunch of deftly, confidently, playfully, fearlessly danced out on the paper with his pen lines. Look at how abstract. It's an expressive drawing melee extravaganza. And it looks like a horse's torso. He knows that anatomy so well. And that form, he knows it like a sculptor. Every line on there is a perspective line. Warped. Like Art Tatum did with melodies. I'm sorry, I can't elaborate. Look up Art Tatum. Crazy meanders of musical lines, utter control of them and aware of how they fit into the bigger, bigger picture. I'm going to have a heart attack. Let's ground. Yes, Matt, good observation. And if you can enjoy this, if you can enjoy, enjoy doing this and continue to do it, it's not wasted. Got four more. Anna, exciting to do these quickly without underdrawings and no erasing. Exciting and proving your metal. Stacy, good work. There's some weird stuff going on in there, but at least we can see that is a really unusual upper leg, but it is a sculptable upper leg. <laughs> Alyssa, very nice. Very nice, the flowing water style in here. It's appealing from the moment we look at it. You can play that. You are playing that. You can play it like a composer who keeps at it until you've got your own visual slash musical style. That's next week's topic. And let me give you a 30 second preview point. Style is not just technique. Most people think of style as how you use the technique, and that's a big part of learning style. But there's also style of composition, style of design, what people call taste. Designing with shape motifs and counterpointing them, or in this case, not. It's almost pretty, there's hardly any straight lines in there. Anyone who can do this has it in them to do more and weave this into a developed style. And Alyssa, don't miss Edmund Dulac if you don't already know Edmund Dulac. Matthew likening them to Chinese characters. Chinese characters evolved they reached a point where they worked well enough not to need to evolve further. Their next stage is into a new species with Matthew as the god behind evolution, turning them into running figures, dancing couples. Yay. Okay. Thank you for the homework. Oh, I am just so pleased to have given you that and for you to give back this much. I felt that was a good investment of our first 40 minutes. We're gonna shift now. We're gonna shift gears and go into formal lecture, not in response to your work, although I will come back to a couple of your pieces. If you'd like the whole course on Heinrich Klei, go to my website, martialart.com.